Okay, so hello and welcome everyone. In this video, I'm going to do a walkthrough of the asymmetric information exercises from the practice exercises that I had circulated. So, uh, all right, and this will be interesting if you don't have them as well, because I've got the questions right here. So, consider the market for used cars. There's two types, high quality, low quality. Buyers are unable to observe the quality. Owners know the value of their car. Those who own a high quality will sell their car if the price is 2000 or higher. Low quality cars will sell for 1000 or higher. Buyer valuations are 1800 and 1200 respectively. I've written this out with willingness to pay. I should have used high and low, but I used willingness to pay for good is 1800, willingness to pay for bad is 12, willingness to sell for good is 12, 2000, willingness to sell for bad is 1000. First question, if the proportion of high quality cars is 0.8, what happens in equilibrium? So this is where consumers are gonna judge the value of a randomly selected car on the basis of their, well, willingness to pay and then their belief about the distribution. So their expected value is going to be 0.8, the proportion of, of good cars, the fraction of good cars times their valuation for good cars, plus 0.2, the fraction of bad cars times their valuation for bad cars, which comes out to 1440 plus 240 or 1680. However, since consumers value a randomly selected car for 18 or for 1680, but sellers won't sell good cars for less than 2000, only bad cars will trade. So we say this is since the price is lower than the price of a higher quality car will accept, only low quality cars will be sold. Ultimately, beliefs are correct in equilibrium. So buyers correctly infer that 0% of the cars are good. And then the price for, the, well, the willingness to pay will crash down to 1200 for a random car, which they'll know with certainty is bad. And the price of the car traded will fall somewhere between 1000 and 1200 We can't say for sure it's going to be one or the other. It depends on the relative bargaining power of the two uh, sides of the market, but anyway. So consider the market for umbrellas. There's two types, high and low quality. Buyers are un unable to observe the quality. Sellers know the value. Each high quality umbrella costs $14. Low quality costs $8. Buyers have valuation of 16 and, and 10 for high and low quality umbrellas. The fraction of high quality umbrellas is one half. What happens in equilibrium? Here's the willingness to pay for a low quality umbrella. Willingness to pay for a high quality umbrella. Cost of a low quality umbrella, cost of a high quality umbrella. These we can take as our willingness to sell for our sellers. Since the quality is unobservable, consumers are going to infer the average quality based on their belief about well, their willingness to pay and then their beliefs about the fraction of good umbrellas. So this is going to be one half times 16 are good plus one half times 10 is their willingness to pay for bad. It gives us a willingness to pay for a randomly selected umbrella of 13. That's below the cost to make a high quality umbrella. So since the consumers value the average umbrella at $13, lower than the cost to produce high quality umbrellas, only the low quality umbrellas will be made. Buyers know the high quality umbrellas will not be offered, so the willingness to pay falls down to 10, at which point firms either keep the price of 13 and then the market just doesn't work at all, or they reduce their price to somewhere between eight and 10 and then trades happen, but only involving the low quality umbrellas. Right? There's no scope for high quality umbrellas as long as consumers believe that the fraction of high quality umbrellas is only a half. All right, another asymmetric information question. Suppose there's two distinct markets for widgets in Arlington, Nebraska. Uh, okay, <laughs> assume the supply is perfectly inelastic above the seller's willingness to accept. Buyers value a high quality widget at 1200, low quality at 8,000. 200 widgets are available, a quarter of them are high quality. Sellers of high quality want 10,000, sellers of low quality want 4,000. So here's our willingness to pay for high quality, for low quality, willingness to accept for a high quality, for low quality. Assume the market functions normally when there's perfect information. Oh, then all 200 widgets are gonna trade and the trade, the price for high quality widgets can be somewhere between this 1,200 and that 10,000 and the price of a low quality somewhere between this 8,000 and that 4,000, that's what this is saying. Now, suppose only the seller knows the quality, what will be the market price? So it, if the buyers are correct about the probability of a high quality widget, so it's gonna be one quarter a high quality times their willingness to pay for high quality. So a quarter times 1200 plus three quarters times 8,000. That's this right here. So the expected value for a randomly selected widget is gonna be 9,000. Well, so that's gonna be the maximum price. That's a problem because that's lower than the willingness to sell for the high quality widget of 10,000. So how many high quality widgets are offered, offered for sale? Well, zero, because that's below the willingness to accept. Once sellers respond to market conditions, what's the new equilibrium price in proportion? Well, it's gonna be all low quality, and the price is gonna be somewhere between that 4,000 and 8,000 that sellers are willing to part with their bad widget and buyers are willing to pay for a bad widget. 
Now suppose sellers of high quality widgets are willing to accept a, tr a trading price of 8,000 rather than 10,000. How does this affect the market equilibrium? Well, what's changed is the willingness to accept of sellers. Buyer's valuation hasn't changed. It's still 9,000 for a randomly selected widget. However, that's now above the price of a, what sellers are willing for, except for a good widget. So matter of fact, actually, what ends up happening is buyer's expected valuation is still 9,000. It's above the willingness to accept for both high and quality, uh, a, a high and low quality widget sellers. So we expect the market's gonna, market's gonna work. <clears throat> okay. Uh, how many more do I have here? So, assume there's two distinct markets for widgets in Arlington. Assume supply is perfectly inelastic above the seller's willingness to accept. Uh, meaning that there, there's not gonna be anything any additional sold above that price. Um, buyers value a high va high quality widget at $90, low quality widget at $30, so these are much cheaper widgets. There's 100 widgets available, a third of them are high quality. Sellers of high quality widgets want $80, sellers of low quality want $25. So here's the willingness to, win, willingness to pay for high, willingness to pay for low, willingness to accept for high, willingness to accept for low. A uh, third of them are good. So how many high and low quality widgets sell if there's perfect information? This means that everybody knows good and bad widgets and can distinguish them. Well, then all 100 are going to trade. So that's this, and the prices lie between the w respective reservation prices. Now suppose only the seller knows the probability of widget. Well, a third are high quality, so it's going to be one-third times willingness to accept or willingness to pay for high quality plus two-thirds times willingness to pay for a low quality. So that gives us an expected valuation of 50. Expected price of a widget is 50. The price of 50, there's no high quality widgets traded because that's below the willingness to accept for sellers of high quality widgets. Once sellers respond to market conditions, what's the new equilibrium price? Uh, it's going to be somewhere between 25 and 30. And it's going to be only low quality widgets are selling. 100% of the widgets selling are going to be bad. So, all right, suppose a new stock of high quality widgets is discovered, bringing the proportion of high quality widgets to four fifths. How does this change the situation? Well, now we're gonna have four fifths times our valuation of a high quality widget plus one fifth times our valuation of a low quality widget brings us to 78, which is a lot higher, but it's not good enough because it's still too below the willingness to accept for sellers of high quality widgets. So since the willingness to pay is still below the asking price for high quality widgets, only low quality widgets are traded. The new stock goes back from whence it came. All right, so Asymmetric information, suppose there's two distinct markets for widgets in Arlington. Supplies perfectly is, is the same question. Now four-fifths are high quality. All right, so how does this change what we're doing? Well, when there's perfect information, we get the exact same result. It's price is just between willingness to accept our reservation prices. And then suppose only a seller knows the quality of the widgets, how many are going to trade. Four-fifths are high quality, so it's going to be your valuation for high quality times value... Uh, plus valuation for low quality. You, you recognize this is like whatever section of this question was, right? So we end up in a situation where the um, only the low quality widgets trade, obviously. Now we have a new, an, even more, even more high quality widgets are found. So now there's gonna be 90% of them are good. What's the effect of this exogenous shock on the market equilibrium? Well, buyer's valuation is gonna be 90, 90% 90 of 90 plus 10% uh, of 30, so we have 84. Now the willingness to pay is above the high quality asking price. So high and low quality widgets are traded at a price of 84. Good. Okay, and then question 12. So consider the market for used cars, which consists of good cars and bad cars. Buyer values a good car at 3,000, bad car at 1,000. Seller values a good car at 2,500, bad car at 900. Assume buyers do not observe the quality, find the fraction so that all cars will trade. Suppose the government provides a one-time payment, a subsidy of 500 when buyers buy used cars, find the fractions that all cars trade. And then suppose 10% are bad mechanic offers to examine a car for sale, certify that they pass, those that pass are good cars. How much is anybody willing to pay for this? Okay, so the first one. So if buyers do not observe the quality of a car, they are going to infer whatever is the whatever is the expected value of a randomly selected car from their willingness to pay and their belief about theta. So the willingness to pay for a good car is 3,000, willingness to pay for a bad car is 1,000. So their expected valuation is gonna be 3,000 times theta plus 1,000 times one minus theta, but we want all cars to trade. So that has to be equal to the willingness to sell for sellers of good cars, equal to 2,500. So that's why willingness to sell of good car is equal to expected value so that all cars trade. 
So 2,500 is equal to 3,000 theta plus 1,000 times 1 minus theta. So theta has to be, what, 0.75. Has to be the fraction of good cars so that all cars trade, because this is what's going to be necessary to make the expected value of a randomly selected car at least as high as the willingness to sell of a good car. So that all cars trade. All right, so then we're going to say, well, suppose we switch this situation up by offering a subsidy from the government of $500. What's going to happen now? Well, what this is going to do is it's going to shift up the, it's going to shift the expectation of consumers so that they'll be able to tolerate a, a larger proportion of bad cars. There's two ways to do this. So I've written this as 2,500. So how are we going to get to this 2,500? Well, we can get to this expected value of 2,500, either from my expected value of a randomly selected car plus this 500 boost, or you could knock this down to 2,000 and make that equal to the expected value of a randomly selected car. Either way, you're going to end up with theta is equal to a half. Notice what's happened. So when the consumer is just going to go into the market and select a randomly selected car with these willingness, these reservation prices, they need three quarters of the cars to be good for the market to work. If the government's going to give $500, then they only need consumers only need half the cars to be good to be willing to participate in this market and with all cars trading. All right, suppose 10% are bad. Mechanic offers a, a service to examine cars for sale, certify those that are good. What's going to happen here? Well, so without the service, the expected value of a randomly selected car is going to be 90% are good. So 0.9 times the valuation of a good car. 10% are bad. 0.1 times the valuation of a bad car is gives us an expected value of 2,800. All right. Well, 2,800 is bigger than 2,500, so all the cars sell. There's no market failure, so that's good. Uh, sellers of bad cars, they're not really going to care because they're getting this nice premium of 2,800 minus, uh, you know, presumably 900. What about sellers of good cars? Well, they're getting this, they're, they're getting 2,800 versus, uh, versus 2,500. However, buyers value good cars at 3,000. So sellers could presumably extract a little bit more surplus if they were to say for sure their car is good. And so there is this additional economic surplus lying between the willingness to pay of 2,800 and the maximal willingness to pay for a good car of 3000 And so sellers could begin to capture some of those $200 by this service. And so if they can if they can attest to the fact that they've got, suppose, suppose the service costs like a dollar, are you gonna do it as a seller? Well, yeah, because now all of a sudden, rather than getting 2800 for your good car, you could get up to 3000 or 2800 for a randomly selected car. You could get up to 3000 for for sure a good car so 3000 minus that uh what willingness to accept 2500 plus one so 2501 and then three whatever it was so um so you you get this substantially higher uh substantially higher surplus so the most anyway sellers would be willing to pay would be 200 because that would be the difference between what they're presently able to get without the insurance or without the certification up to the maximal amount that they could get if they were able to attest that the car was actually good. So anyway, hope you enjoy. Like, subscribe, whatever.